Good morning and welcome to the uh, talk from the Bible for this morning's online service. And today I'm just going to be finishing off the last bit of 1 John. If you joined us last week, uh, you'll know that I spoke through chapter 4 and into chapter 5. And today we'll finish the book before we move on to different stuff in the weeks ahead. So uh, it's good to have a chance to do that. I'm just going to pray for us before we begin. Gives you a chance to grab your Bibles if you want one or load them up on your screen or your tablet or whatever. And then we will dive in. So Father, I just pray uh, that for all of those who are listening, that you would take what I've prepared. And as we open the Bible together, that you would speak to each person by your Holy Spirit in the ways that they need to hear. And I pray that uh, all the things that 1 John uh, talks about, growing in love, growing in righteousness, accepting you for who you are, I pray that these would go deep into our hearts and would change the way that we live so that we would know you more and that our joy would be complete. Amen. So then, uh, one of the reasons why uh, Amblecote we like to teach through books of the Bible is that it forces you to confront bits that are a bit more tricky or a bit confusing or to be honest, the stuff that if I was in charge of putting the Bible together, I just wouldn't have put in at all. Um, you find them all over the place, uh, but this passage that we're going to look at today includes a couple of things that are a bit like that really, that you sort of, uh, we all know that God is the definition of wisdom and yet in our human finitude, we sometimes scratch our heads and think, why exactly did he leave that in there the way it is? Because it's just a bit confusing. So we'll look at a couple of those, we'll try and make sense of them together, and then we'll think a bit about what, uh, what we can take from the text that's important for us as we follow Jesus. So I'm gonna read it through and then talk about it. So 1 John chapter five, verses kind of four, three to the end. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we're from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. So there you go. Some interesting stuff in there. We know by now, if we've been uh, keeping up with this series, that John has spent the letter discussing right belief in Jesus, right living, and right loving. This is what it means to be a Christian, and this is how, he says, we can be assured that we're truly part of the church and part of the kingdom of God, those three dimensions. 
And in these closing paragraphs, John seems to address a couple of complications that had arisen in the community to which he was originally writing. So for the original church he would have received this letter, they would have known what John was kind of commenting on, what he was trying to deal with, because they would have been living in the middle of it. It's a bit more difficult for us because we're not the same church, we don't have exactly the same issues. So we have to guess a little bit at what might have been going on that might have caused John to write the sort of things that he did. So um, it's impossible sometimes to be certain uh, what, what was happening. Uh, but this morning, you know, I'm going to try and pick up a couple of clues from the text and suggest one way that we may want to understand these slightly difficult verses. So beginning back at verse four, then, this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God? So having finished his discussion of what Christian love is, which we talked about last week, John gives us his final discussion on what true Christian belief is. And again, he emphasises that the, the key thing is to accept Jesus for who he says he is. We have to believe that Jesus is the son of God. And here's where then it gets a little bit confusing. He says, for this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And it seems to me that um, probably what was happening is that there was some disagreement between John and others in the church, potentially those that he calls the antichrists, those who are working against the true gospel of Jesus. And this comment here probably refers to that disagreement. Through the centuries, different scholars and pastors have suggested different solutions, and we can't be certain. Uh, but one widely held view is that when John's talking about water, he's referring to Jesus' baptism by John, and then Jesus' own ministry of baptising. And um, the insight, so to reference sort of coming by water is a shorthand, really, for talking about Jesus' earthly ministry. Um, his teaching, his baptising, kind of what he did while he was with us, ministering. By blood, in contrast, he's referring particularly to Jesus' death and its atoning significance. That Jesus' death allows us to be forgiven of our sin, allows us to be reconciled to God. And it seems then that some in the church were willing to accept Jesus' ministry and his teaching, that he came by water, but weren't willing to accept Jesus' death, resurrection, and the idea that that allowed our sins to be forgiven. So they accepted Jesus came by water, but denied in John's terminology that he came by blood. And if this is correct, then what John's doing is he's just reasserting that the Son of God didn't just have an earthly ministry of teaching, but we have to embrace the significance of his death as well. And many Christian heresies right from the earliest years have denied something about Jesus' death or some aspect of it. You know, for Greeks, the Greek tradition thought of God as uh, a being incapable of suffering or of pain. So the idea that God would come and submit himself to a painful crucifixion was foolishness, you know, it was unthinkable for the Greek heritage. That In the Jewish heritage, uh, if somebody was hung on a tree, then they were cursed by God. So the idea that the Son of God could be kind of crucified and hung on a tree was also fairly unthinkable for them. So perhaps it's no surprise then that, um, that these readers who John was writing to, or hearers, uh, struggled with this aspect of Jesus. And this has always been a temptation, perhaps that's what was going on here. But against all this, John says, no true saving faith is to accept Jesus' earthly ministry, but also to accept his death, that he came by water and blood. And he goes on to say then, and the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. So he goes on to say really that his gospel uh, is also affirmed by the Holy Spirit. And he probably means that both inwardly in terms of in believers' hearts, 
the Holy Spirit affirms the truth of his gospel, but also outwardly in works of power and miracles, a constant theme throughout the New Testament, that the power of the Holy Spirit affirmed the gospel message that the apostles taught. So that's what the water and the blood and the spirit probably refer to. And why is John bang on about there being three of them? Well, this is because in Jewish law, which you can still read in the Old Testament, um, it said that no matter could be established without having two or three witnesses. So having three people to testify to something was necessary for something to be established by Jewish law. So if I stole your car, nobody saw me, uh, you'd have some trouble before Jewish law. Um, but if there were two or three witnesses who would testify, then that matter could be established. And so John here is really just working out of a Jewish worldview to say there's three kind of testimonies to the work of Jesus, his teaching and his ministry, his death and all that that accomplished, and the Holy Spirit. And so he sort of, that's why he kind of goes for three. And he then goes on to really talk about that being the testimony of God and saying, well, if we believe human testimony on three witnesses, then surely we should accept God's testimony as he's testified in these three ways. The life and ministry of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. In three ways, God has testified to us about his son. And should we not therefore accept God's testimony? And we're going to come back to that at the end, because again, really, John is pushing the question here. Will you accept God on his own terms? Will you accept God as he claims to be? And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that at the end of uh, this morning. Moving on to the sort of next slightly tricky bit. John says that he writes these things to us. He believe that we may have eternal life and that if we have this confidence, um, that we can ask anything according to his will and we will know that he hears us and then gives us our requests. As with other parts of the Bible that talk like this, uh, sometimes when we need to faith, this can sound amazing, great. If I uh, have confidence before God, I can give him my requests and I'll receive them. It can sound a little bit like the ultimate sort of Christmas list really, where you can put your requests down and you're guaranteed through some sort of divine slot machine that you'll get what you want. But that, um, as we quickly find out, is not how prayer works. Uh, instead, what this speaks to is that when, um, so to go back to the text here, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So when our hearts have been shaped and formed to want what God wants and to desire what he desires, and when that is the content of our prayers, then we can be confident that they'll be granted because he's changed our desires for things that are truly good. So, um, you know, just a little comment on the journey of prayer, really, that uh, the journey of prayer always includes and begins with asking for things from God. You know, Jesus says we do that every day. We ask him for our daily bread every day. But as we mature and grow, the deeper journey of prayer is to allow God to change us rather than for us to keep for asking things from God. Both are important, um, but John here is alluding really to that transformation of our will. Okay, moving on then to perhaps the most troubling bit of this text, the sins that lead to death or don't lead to death. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. Uh, but there is a sin that leads to death. Now, ironically, in a book whose whole purpose is for our assurance <laughs> and to help us to know that we have eternal life, this verse often produces some extreme panic in us as we all worry, have I committed the sin that leads to death? A bit like when Jesus says in the gospel, there's a, there's a sin that will not be forgiven. And we all think, oh no, have I done it? So, I just want to offer a few thoughts on this. It is a hard verse to interpret. And it's helpful then to bear in mind a principle that when we have a hard verse to interpret, where we're not quite sure how to understand it, it's helpful to read it in the context of the whole of that book and the whole of scriptures to try and work out what might this mean. 
So if we read it in the context of the whole of the book of John, well, what might be sins not leading to death? I suggest that's any sin that a Christian commits. You know, John says, if you're without sin, if you say you're without sin, then you're a liar and we all sin. And that's why it's so important to walk in the light, to walk in repentance, uh, to bring our sin before our brothers and sisters so that they can pray for us, that we can be restored. That's why it's so important. Jesus' atoning work on the cross. So for John, Christians committing sins is not a problem. That's the expectation. <laughs> and that's why um, Jesus' death is so important and these mechanics of confession, repentance. So for, that's my understanding. A sin not leading to death is any sin a Christian commits. You can't go too big. You know, um, you can't do something too bad that crosses the line as a Christian. So a sin leading to death must be some kind of sin that intrinsically leads to death because it separates us from uh, the offer of forgiveness and repentance and life. It must be a sin that cuts us off from being able to be forgiven. And therefore, this is likely to be the sin of refusing to accept God on his terms, you know, denying that Jesus is who he says he is or denying these kind of main points that John's laid out in the book, um, essentially refusing to understand God in the way that he truly is. And I want to be crystal clear. So this isn't about human frailty. This isn't about the times where we each doubt or the times where we have a tough week and we don't know where we are. It's not human frailty, it's human pride that John's getting at here. It's the denial of God because we think we know better. That's the sin that ultimately cuts us off from God. I'll prob and again, I'll come back to that at, at the end briefly, but that is the sin that leads to death. It's the sin that's saying, I don't need Jesus or I don't accept you as you are, because that's the only place we can be where we can't receive forgiveness, is when we reject it. Finally then, what about John's instructions for prayer? He says, you know, I don't say you should pray about that, or they about other sins, you pray for your brothers and sisters that they'll be restored. What's he saying is, he's saying that we shouldn't pray for people to become Christians, or we shouldn't pray for people whose hearts have been hardened, that they would be softened. I don't, I don't think he is. Um, well, he's certainly not saying you shouldn't. He, he just says you don't have to. And I think probably what he's getting at is, again, to do with the nature of the sin, because God is a respecter of people's choices. God never compels us to follow him. It can feel like that sometimes when the Holy Spirit stares us, but ultimately God will respect people's choices. So I guess what John's saying is, you know, you don't have to pray that God would um, take away people's choice and would override their freedom because that's not the sort of God he is. He's uh, not prohibiting us from praying for repentance. In fact, I do that. I'm sure you do that as well for people that we love. But he is, I guess, really communicating something about God's nature, that God is a God who allows people to make their choices. And we don't, you know, to pray that God would take that away is is a difficult prayer because you know, that perhaps denies the humanity that God's created us with and denies God's nature to pray that. There's probably more that could be said, um, but I hope that makes some sense of it for you. Um, if you do find this particularly disturbing, as ever, you know, give me a call and um, I'll try and explain perhaps a bit better than I have done just now, or we can talk it through. Finally then, we know that everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We've come across this stuff in John before. We know we're from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come and given us understanding. So we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. So these final thoughts from John really return to assurance that even though the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, we know that the Son of God's come and that he is given us understanding and he will guard us in the truth so that we attain eternal life. So returning really to the point of the book that despite everything that may be the case 
and everything that kicks off in life, we can set our hearts at rest before him and know that we're in the truth in the ways that John describes. To finish then, let's return to um, perhaps the main thrust of this difficult chapter, um, the great divide, we might say, that John really sets before us the key choice for all humankind. He says, look, you can either accept God for who he says he is and live on those terms, or you can deny it and you can deny him. And the consequence of one is eternal life, and the consequence of the other is eternal death. It reminds me a bit of what C.S. Lewis used to say. He, he used to say that in the end, either man says to God, thy will be done, or God says to man, thy will be done. There's no uh, other place to be in the end between the two. You know, if God is truly God, the creator of the universe and of me and you, who sent his son, Jesus, to teach us the way to God in his ministry, to make it possible to come to God in his death. He then sends the Holy Spirit to us as our paraclete, our comforter, comforter, encourager, enabler. He testifies about this work in the ways that John has said. Then really we all have a decision to make. Do we accept that testimony of God as he says he is? living as he calls us to live, loving as he calls us to love, as John has talked about through the book, so that our joy may be complete, finding the way that leads to life? Or do we say that we know better than him, that we deny? No, God, actually, I don't think you are who you say you are. I think you're something different. Or uh, that we know better about what makes for a good life and a righteous life. Actually, I've got a better sense of justice than you, God. Or I've got a better handle on what it means to love someone than you do. A different version of the truth, perhaps. You know, in the, in the end, um, God understands our human frailty. Like I said, I'm not talking about our frailty. But in the end, there's either a submission to God or a slavery to our pride. This has always been the ultimate choice for mankind. And as we finish our walk through 1 John... Um, Wherever you're at, you know, whether you've known and submitted to God for many years or maybe you're watching this, exploring Christian faith, um, I hope we could all think about that over the next week of the two ways before us really to either submit to the God who is truly there and live in the way that he leads us on that leads to life or whether we want to stay enslaved to our own pride, our own agenda and our own attempt to um, secure life, which ultimately won't lead there, but will lead us to death. So I'll pray once more to finish, and then that'll be that from 1 John. Father, we recognise your authority as the creator to make clear to us the way that leads to life. And we thank you that you understand our frailty, that you know we're gonna sin, you know we're gonna get it wrong, you know we're gonna doubt, you know all of that, that's okay. You've made a way through Jesus for our frailty. And we thank you for that. And we pray that you would save us from our pride that we would truly find life rather than finding death. In Jesus' name, amen.